Well, hello again. We have made it to the end of the semester. Congratulations. We have one more chapter to go. So this week we're going to be honing in on chapter 21, social movements and social change. Now let's kind of start out this week with, with some definitions for you. Um, and then we'll move into a little bit more of a discussion on, on your social movements um, and different you know, evidence of social change that we've been seeing um, you know, in the past 20 years or so. So here's some definitions to start us out. We're going to start really broad and start working our way uh, to more specifics. But collective behavior, right, it's a pretty broad term. It refers to any non-institutionalized activity in which several or many people voluntarily engage. So your keywords there are italicized, right? It's a non-institutionalized activity, meaning, you know, the government's not making you do this. The Your school is not making you do this. No major social institution is forcing you to do something and it is voluntary right you take part in collective behavior because you want to now there's three forms of collective behavior so i see a quiz question on these three forms in your future um, so we'll look at each one of these individually in a second so we have the crowd the mass and the public Number one, we've got a crowd. So a crowd is referring to any time there's a large number of people in close proximity. Simple enough, right? Pretty straightforward. That's probably what you were thinking of when I said a crowd. Um, however, we're going to take a little tangent here on crowds and look at four types of crowds. All right. So I see a matching question in your future on the next quiz and perhaps on the final exam. So casual crowd is our first type of crowd. This might be the one that you are probably thinking of. Um, so this is the casual crowd when people are at the same place at the same time, but they don't really care about each other necessarily. They're not there to be with each other. They're not interacting. Um, they're there for their own purposes, right? When you go to the mall, you probably have, you know, some things that you're looking for, right? You're there with a whole bunch of other people who are also looking for things, um, but you're not necessarily there to interact with one another primarily. Same thing at the grocery store or Starbucks, right? Um, or CVS or a, you know, waiting room for a doctor or emergency room. You're there with people at the same place, same time, but you're there for your own purposes, to get your own you know, goal accomplished. You're not there specifically to interact with other people. Our second type of crowd is a conventional crowd. So a conventional crowd refers to when people are coming together for a scheduled event that occurs regularly or conventionally. So, um, you know, some of you may have heard of, you know, like they have video game cons um, or anime cons or whatever kind of cons. Um, usually every summer, you know, there's Dragon Con, I think, in Atlanta, right? So those are events that are scheduled. They're planned like a year out. People know that they're happening. They buy tickets to go to them. They occur regularly. They occur every year, um, you know, around the same time, around the same month. And people come together specifically for that scheduled event or con or convention. Um, so some more common examples of a conventional crowd might be, you know, your 11 a.m. church service on Sunday, or if you're an early bird, you're you know, 9 a.m., um, you know, you meet every Sunday. It's a scheduled event. It occurs regularly. 
same thing if you are in any on-campus classes this semester. Um, so college students coming together every Monday and Wednesday at 3 o'clock for a lecture. Um, that would also be a conventional crowd. Or if you're into the Friday night lights and you go out to the high school football games um, you know, every Friday at whatever, 7 o'clock. Um, it's a scheduled event. It occurs regularly, weekly. Uh, and people are coming together specifically for that purpose for this event. So there's our first two types of crowds, our casual crowds, our conventional crowds. Number three, an expressive crowd. So an expressive crowd is when people come together to express an emotion. So that word express is your keyword there for an expressive crowd. Um, so anytime people are coming together, right, to either celebrate for like a birthday or a wedding or to grieve or mourn together, like at a funeral um, or other kind of commemoration. Anytime people are coming together specifically to express some sort of shared emotion um, about an event. All right, so we got casual crowds conventional crowds, expressive crowds. And number four, lastly here, we have our acting crowd, which will start to get us thinking more about you know, like social movements. So an acting crowd refers to when people join together with a cause, with a purpose, in order to focus on a specific goal or an action. So something like a protest movement or a riot or a flash mob. Anybody remember flash mobs? It's been a while. Look them up if you don't remember them. Um, I hope they come back someday. So uh, anytime, right, the people are coming together to achieve something together, to achieve some sort of goal or to you know, act collectively on behalf of a certain, um, you know, maybe ideology or, uh, or purpose. All right, so we just took our little crowd tangent. So remember, let's come back to where we started here. We were looking at the three types of collective behavior, which were the crowd, the mass, and the public. So back to our collective behavior, right? We looked at the crowd, we looked at the four types of crowds. And now, number two, the second form of collective behavior, we're going to call a mass. Now, a mass, you may have heard the word, you know, like mass media, right? So mass refers to a large number of people with a common interest. Keyword is interest here, though they may not be in close proximity. So unlike a crowd, which is usually in the same place at the same time, a mass doesn't have to be in the same place at the same time. They don't have to be in close proximity. And the key here is that they share interests, which will contrast with the next slide that we're going to look at. So some examples. Um, you know, players of Fortnite, right? Or um, people who get on Twitch or whatever to watch, you know, a certain game or celebrity. Um, people who play, you know, Grand Theft Auto or Farmville. They're people, they're not in the same place at the same time, but they share some sort of common interest. Or, you know, get on Facebook groups or get on Reddit. Look at the different threads they have, um, you know, on Facebook and Reddit. There's all sorts of different masses out there, different, you know, groupings of people, collectives of people who share, um, you know, more specific interests, and they communicate about those interests um, you know, via the internet, right? So the internet is full of masses. And then our third type of collective behavior is the public. 
So the public refers to a relatively organized and diffused group of people. So again, you know, diffused means they're not necessarily in the same place at the same time. Um, so again, to contrast with the crowd, but the key for a public is not um, shared interests like a mass, but shared ideas and ideologies, ideological viewpoints. So members of a public share ideas. Um, so, you know, if you think about you know, every single citizen of the United States, what kind of things do we share with one another? You know, ideally, right, you go to the Constitution and there's certain rights in there, um, the right to free speech, you know, the right to peaceful assembly, that hopefully, you know, we can all as American citizens, you know, agree on these big ideas, these ideological viewpoints, um, you know, of our individual rights. On the other hand, there's also a lot of division within our, you know, nation. And so members of a political party could also be considered, you know, two different, if we're looking at, you know, the Democrats or the Republicans, two major, you know, American publics, the Democratic public and the Republican public. Um, and they, you know, tend to have kind of different ideological perspectives, right, on, um, you know, the purpose of government and um, you know what government should be what its goals should be and what our beliefs um, and goals as a nation should be to strive for so we've got our three forms of collective behavior our crowd same place at the same time our mass people who are not in the same place at the same time but they share interests and our public pretty or unorganized group, not necessarily in the same place at the same time, but they share you know, ideological perspectives, viewpoints, they share ideas. All right, so now let's move a little bit beyond our definitions here um, and just start to think about, you know, when you are thinking about social movements, this term, what comes to your mind. Now, hopefully, I mean, if you grew up in the US, right, if you live here, if you're a citizen, um, you know that this country was really founded on social movements, right? The American Revolution um, was a social movement, you know, that started against, right, the British tyranny over, um, over the colonies. And this uh, you know, kind of revolt against taxation without representation. So our country really is founded on social movement and social upheaval. Um, and you know, even going back to the earliest years of our newfound country, um, there's some really big social movements that um, defined our country very early on, like Shays Rebellion. If you've never heard of that, look it up. It's a really interesting story. Kind of the first major revolt um, in the United, the newly founded United States. All right. But also, you know, when you're thinking about social movements, especially more modern day um, or more recently, you might be thinking about, um, you know, certainly Black Lives Matter. Um, you know, the civil rights movement back in the 60s, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., maybe the, you know, anti-war movement of the late 60s and 70s, you know, against the draft and the Vietnam War. Um, and again, you know, maybe you're thinking of kind of our really early history of our country, the Boston Tea Party and all the kind of upheaval against, um, you know, colonial rule, which led to the founding of this country. So, I mean, my point is we're probably, and I would too, you know, would be thinking about kind of the most dramatic examples of social movements, the most dynamic examples. 
the ones that make the history books, right? However, you know, not every social movement is so dramatic and dynamic. There are social movements that happen around us every single day that may not necessarily make a, a textbook one day, um, but people are coming together for a purpose, for their own you know, ideas or ideological interests, uh, you know, every single day and making change happen, whether that be at a local or a global level. Um, so I have some examples on here. You know, there's the you know Texas Homeschool Coalition. Um, you have tiny house conferences. You have um, you know MAD, which is Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Um, they've actually made a lot of um, differences in our state and federal um, laws concerning you know drunk driving in the past 40 years. Uh, and then you have critical mass over on the left, top left, which is kind of a, a group of, it happens in a lot of larger cities, a bunch of people get together on bikes and kind of take over the, the roadways to protest against um, the automobile and how we're so de dependent on, um, you know, cars and trucks and buses and all that. All right, so what's a social movement? It refers to any purposeful, organized group that strives to work toward a common social goal. So there's a purpose, they're organized, and they have a specific goal they're trying to achieve. They can be local, they can be statewide, they can be national or global. You know, local movements, you've got citywide movements to, you know, get rid of crime, reduce pollution, uh, eradicate political corruption. At the state level, you know, there's, um, there's some state movements like Texas Secede or the Cal Exit Movement, which advocate for you know, the secession of Texas or California from the United States. You've got national movements like the NAACP. Uh, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, who advocates, you know, for equality of all rights of all people and to eliminate race-based discrimination at a national level. And even at the global level, you have non-governmental organizations like Oxfam or Fair Trade International, these large global movements um, who have, you know, pretty broad global goals to reduce global poverty, um, to help feed, you know, um, people in peripheral or semi-peripheral countries or to support farmers worldwide. All right, some more categories for you. So sociologists, we categorize social movements into kind of five different types. And they're categorized based on what they want to change or achieve and how much they want to change. Like how drastic is the change that they're looking for? So we'll look at each of these. It's going to be reform movements, resistance movements, religious or redemptive movements, alternative movements, and revolutionary movements. P.S. I see another matching question in your future when we talk about these five types of social movements. So first up here, we have our reform movements. So a reform movement is seeking to change something specific about the social structure. They have, you know, one specific interest, one thing, one goal that they want to achieve. Um, they're not trying to change the entire society or the entire political structure or economic structure. They're just, you know, focused on one thing and they want to make change in that one arena. So going back to like chapter 12, right? The women's suffrage movement, their main goal, their specific goal that they were fighting for was 
gaining the right for women to vote. You know, beyond that, they didn't really have too many other goals. Um, it's kind of, you know, one overarching goal. Of course, the goals changed once they achieved it, but, you know, up until 1920 and the 19th Amendment, that was kind of the specific goal they were um, you know, looking to achieve. Um, unionization movements, um, the human rights campaign, advocacy for marriage equality, anti-nuclear groups or anti-war groups, um, PETA, right? PETA <clears throat> is all about the ethical treatment of animals, right? They don't, they're not necessarily an anti-war group, they're not necessarily a suffrage group. They care about animals and their ethical treatment, and that's their specific, um, you know, interest, their specific uh, idea that brings them together, and the goals that they have always have to do with that, you know, overarching theme. And then that other group, MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, that's kind of in the name exactly what they are for, or actually against. Um, you know, again, a very specific kind of goal that they want to achieve. So reform movements, main word here to keep in mind is, you know, they don't want to change everything about society. They have specific interests, specific goals that they want to you know, achieve um, within the social structure that exists. Our second type of social movement is a resistance movement. So resistance movement, you know, when you resist something, you're trying not to let something happen, right? So you're, so these types of movements are seeking to prevent or undo changes that have already been made to the social structure. So for instance, going back to our industrial revolution, yeah, um, Kind of following up on the Industrial Revolution in the U.S. and in England, there were these major agrarian movements that rose up kind of in resistance to kind of the, the factory, the big cities, the pollution, um, and the agrarian movements um, kind of were, were pretty strong for a while as a resistance movement against industrialism. Also, uh, after the Civil War, you kind of have the, um, the build-up uh, of the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, um, kind of, again, in resistance to, uh, you know, the, the end of slavery and the, uh, you know, path for you know, African Americans to be included as full citizens of this country. Um, you have the Minuteman Project, which uh, was kind of really, um, it was a larger movement kind of in the early 2000s, and it was kind of a reactionary, a resistance movement against a lot of the um, like demographic change, the immigration right, rate into the U.S. Uh, so the Minuteman Project was, were groups of um, of people in, in southern states, kind of border states, primarily, you know, Texas, Arizona, um, and there were people who were kind of forming their own little state militias across the border to, to watch, um, you know, to watch the border themselves. And then the pro-life movement, um, of course, after Roe versus Mate, Wade in 1973 really kicked off as a resistance movement to that court ruling um, and to, you know, to stop abortion or put a halt to it, um, which the Supreme Court may be uh, reconsidering that ruling um, this year in 2022. Our third type of social movement, we have religious or redemptive movements. So these are the types of movements that are you know, meaning seeking. 
they promote themselves as, you know, some sort of, um, you know, religious organization. Um, they try to provoke inner change in the members of their movement, spiritual growth in individuals, and many of them, you know, are also their aim is to convert as many people as possible. Um, so I think I talked about the People's Temple in the previous chapter. Um, there's also a, a similar kind of redemptive religious movement called Heaven's Gate um, from, they were around for about 30 years I and mean, from like the 70s into the 90s. And then Scientology, kind of a more uh, religious movement that is still with us today. Um, it's been around since, what, I think the 50s. Um, but has a lot of a very powerful uh, religious movement in this country. Number four, we have our alternative movement. These are movements that have really gained a lot of traction since like the 80s. They're focused more on self-improvement and making like limited specific changes to individual beliefs and behaviors. But people still kind of come together in a movement around these individual changes. So things like diet fads, uh, like the keto diet or you know, vegan or vegetarianism, um, yoga, uh, transcendental meditation, all these things that really kind of have to do more with like you as an individual and changing your behavior um, or your attitudes or your beliefs um, or your rituals, right? But um, people come together kind of to, to focus on this self-improvement in alternative movements. And lastly, our revolutionaries. Our revolutionary movements seek to completely change every aspect of a society. So that contrasts with our reform movements, right? Reform movements, they're not happy with like one specific thing. They want to fix that one thing. Revolutionary movements say, no. You know, we don't like any of what's going on, tear it all down, and we have to rebuild society. Um, so there are some, uh, a lot of, you know, prominent examples of revolutionary movements go back to, you know, like the countercultures of the 1960s and the 70s. Um, there's a group called the Weather Underground back in the um, late 60s, early 70s. I have a little video on them on Blackboard if you're interested on in that. Um, but they were like an anti, primarily like an anti-war group, um, but also, you know, stood for against many things about you know, the U.S. society at the time, not just anti-war <clears throat> and anti-draft, but you know, anti-capitalism, anti-racism. Um, they stood against a lot of things that they were seeing in you know, society at the time. Um, similarly, you have the Black Panther movement um, started out in California that had, um, but also had chapters across the country and still do today. Um, but the Black Panthers, you know, kind of promoted a, <clears throat> an, um, an idea of you know, black power of not needing necessarily white society to, um, you know, incorporate, you know, African American or black people into mainstream society, <clears throat> but instead they focused on, you know, creating their own society. So Black Panthers tended to have a more like communist kind of ideology. Um, they set up a lot of like local food pantries, local health centers, um, where people could, you know, go and volunteer their time, but they also knew that if they ever needed food, if they ever needed health care, um, they had a place where they could go and get that. And as you can see, you know, they also um, 
were pretty well known for kind of wearing their militia garb, um, kind of uniforms, and for bearing arms in public. Um, because not too dissimilar to today, um, you know, the Black Panthers didn't think that a lot of police officers were there to protect them. And so their kind of ideology was that they had to, you know, arm themselves and protect their, themselves in their own neighborhoods. So that's a, a little bit about the Black Panther Party. Um, and then, you know, various Marxist anarchist groups would fit within um, this kind of definition as well. So revolutionary movements. All right, so we got through our movements. Uh, a little bit more on movements. There tends to be kind of a life cycle to social movements that kind of, you know, build up. Uh, they institutionalize and then they go into a decline stage. So you've got the preliminary stage. People start to become aware of an issue. Leaders emerge. Then you have the coalescent stage. People start to join together to get out there, to organize. They publicize the issue. They get news coverage. Um, they get on social media and make a hashtag. They organize protests. They raise awareness. <clears throat> Once they've achieved that, they can move into the institutionalization stage when things start to kind of get kind of bureaucratic, going back to chapter six. Um, but this is when the movement kind of turns into a more established organization. There's a paid staff, usually a hierarchy of authority within the staff. Um, there's not as much reliance on grassroots volunteerism anymore. And then hopefully once they've kind of gotten to that stage, they can succeed at whatever their goal was and they start to decline. Um, so once they kind of achieve that goal, the change that they want, supporters might start to fall away or join other movements or you know, if the movement doesn't achieve the goals that it wants to, people might like lose momentum, lose enthusiasm, and still, you know, look elsewhere. Now to our theories. Um, so remember our the three broad paradigms in sociology. We had structural functionalism, symbolic interactionism, and conflict theory. So within each of these paradigms, um, you know, we kind of have a specific perspective on social movements that arises from them. So we'll look at three different perspectives on social movements, like how do they succeed? Um, what explains their success, basically? So we'll look at number one, resource mobilization theory, which comes to us from a, a structural functionalist perspective. We'll look at framing analysis, which is kind of a symbolic interactionist perspective, and then new social movement theory, which is a more conflict theory perspective to social movements. Now, the first one here comes to us from our structural functionalist theory. Just basically, it's going to tell us, you know, what does a social movement need to succeed? Well, look at our picture here. You need time. You need money. Um, and it's kind of in the name, right? If you can mobilize your resources effectively, then your social movement has a better chance to succeed. So more specifically, you know, success of a social movement depends on money, most definitely, probably primarily, you need those resources. If you have money, then you can hire a full-time staff, usually in a hierarchical organization with personnel. Everyone has a specialized task to achieve. And, you know, 
Hopefully we can get some volunteers as well to join in and help out, volunteer their time. Number three, you need organization infrastructure. Um, you need, you know, for that full-time staff, you need an office or office building. You need workspaces, phones, computers, printers, access to the internet, um, you know, a Twitter account, all sorts of organization infrastructure. And then social networks that can enable widespread support. And it's not just those things that you need. So you have to think about a little bit more as well, say the resource mobilization theorists. Um, you know, you, the fact that there's an injustice is not really enough according to them. You also need, again, those resources and that organization in order to really make change. And they would say, you know, a revolutionary movement is not going to be very effective usually because most people in society are pretty comfortable with the way things are. Most people don't want to wake up and have everything be completely changed tomorrow morning. So resource mobilization theorists say that movements have to think small. So they would be more um, supportive of, say, like the reform movements, you know, movements that are very limited in what they want to change. They are looking to change something very specific, right, within the current social structure. <clears throat> so thinking small. So having narrow incremental goals rather than revolutionary goals. And that can help to avoid you know, divisions or schisms within a group. You'll tend to have more allies if you kind of think small and you'll have a greater achieve, um, chance of achieving those goals. Now, resource mobilization theory kind of comes to us from this other theory um, kind of that comes more from psychology called rational choice theory. And this theory states that people are generally self-interested, rational actors. And that means that people take part in certain actions um, for rational reasons. They sit and they make a list in their mind of pros and cons, and they use their logic over their emotion. Um, now, you may be, I mean, everyone thinks differently about these things, but, um, you know, when you think about social movements, do you think people are coming at it from a more rational choice, you know, kind of background? People join social movements with kind of logic, um, and rationality and self-interest at the front of their mind? Or, you know, do you think that people join social movements more out of like emotion um, or emotional motivation or irrational? Um, motivations, right? What we might call like the mob mentality. But for a resource mobilization theorist, they argue, you know, people join social movements out of rational, out of their rational minds. Um, they're using, you know, strategic instrumental reasoning rather than emotional reactions as their you know, primary motivator for joining a movement. And so because of that, you know, not only do you need time and money and organization and infrastructure and volunteers and all that, but these things are also key right here. You also need all of the right circumstances to occur for a movement to succeed, right? Not only all those other things, organization, infrastructure, money, um, but you also need the right time and place for the social movement. Political opportunities for success or failure might depend on, you, know, you need the support of the public, mass public sentiment, 
You need leadership and power that's going to be sympathetic to your movement, right? If I'm a um, if I'm a gun rights activist group, right, and that's my movement, um, but there's a far right wing person in the presidency and as the governor of my state, um, it's probably not the right time and the place to push for you know, limitations to the Second Amendment, right? Um, or if there's like mass crime across the country, you know, the mass public sentiment will probably be more for, you know, self-protection um, and gun rights rather than you know, limiting gun um, access. So you have to choose the right time and place for your social movement to succeed as well. All right, so that's enough. That's number one. Uh, we looked at our resource mobilization theory, which kind of comes to us from the structural functionalist paradigm. Now we're going to turn to our second theory here of social movements, which is framing analysis. So um, this one comes to us from symbolic interactionist paradigm which again puts a big emphasis on interpretation, communication, and meaning making, right? So we kind of have this concept of frames when we think about social movements. Um, frames are kind of like, you know, a shortcut. Think of when you frame a picture, um, you know, you're putting something around a piece of art that is going to you know, accentuate maybe certain colors of that artwork. Um, and in the same way frames, you know, you take a certain argument of a movement and you frame that argument in a very specific way. Um, it's going to help the public, the mass, the masses to easily understand and identify what your movement is about. So I sometimes call framing like the sloganization of movements. But frames, you know, kind of help us as individuals to easily identify and understand social events um, and what we should do about them. So framing analysis um, is a big part of sociology, especially in symbolic interactionism. And Frames explain kind of how a social movement's cause is communicated by using language, um, visuals, argumentation that helps to shape the public debate in their favor, or at least they try to. Um, so framing often simplifies big social issues into easily understandable and usually emotive slogans, you usually pull on your heartstrings a little bit. Um, so you can think of, you know, a pretty relevant topic today, um, you know, like the, the pro-choice movement versus the pro-life movement, right? Um, each of these movements has their own goals that they want to achieve. And at some point in time, you know, in the past 40, 50 years, these movements decided that they wanted to be known within these frames as the quote unquote pro-choice movement or the quote unquote pro-life movement. Each one of these groups, right, is portraying themselves as for something, not against something, but for something, not anti. And kind of the implication is that whoever's not part of their movement is anti whatever they are pro. So if you're pro-choice and someone does not align with your group, well then you're anti-choice. Or if you're pro-life and someone doesn't align with your group, well then you're anti-life. And who wants to be anti-life? That sounds horrible. Who wants to be anti-choice? That also doesn't sound great, especially in our country where freedom of choice is, um, you know, pretty, you know, critical. Um, so you can see kind of how, you know, movements create these frames, right? 
these kind of slogans, these ways that they want the public to interpret their movement as. And what kind of the repercussions of that framing um, can be. Now, framing analysis kind of involves three different types of framing. Um, so there's diagnostic framing, prognostic framing, and motivational framing in social movements. So diagnostic framing is when a problem is stated in a clear and easily understood way. The issue is presented in a way that there's no gray areas. It's all black and white. One way is right, the other way is wrong. We'll go through some examples in a minute here. Um, prognostic framing offers solutions to the issue, presenting a way to fix it, plans to implement changes. So, okay, we know that one way is wrong, the other way is right. What are we going to do about it? How should we fix it, right? That would be prognostic framing. And lastly, motivational framing involves a call to action. So these are action-oriented frames that tell you what you should do once you decide, okay, I agree that, you know, there's a problem. One way is right, one way is the other. I agree with the way you say we should fix it. What do you want me to do to support you? So the frame may advocate for supporters to go out and protest or to go vote for or against the bill or to call their congressperson. So here's some examples from um, kind of the lead up before that Obergefell versus Hodges Supreme Court case in 2015. You know, there was a lot of protests around the country for and against you know, gay marriage. So I'm going to use some signs over here on the right, some framing um, to illustrate these three types of frames in the anti-gay marriage movement. So diagnostic framing, again, says one way is right, the other way is just wrong. And that's how they're going to present the movement to people. So if you look at the top picture over here, right, you've got a sign, I support biblical marriage, right? That's stating pretty clearly, you know, biblical marriage is the right, the right type of marriage, right? It conveys that gay marriage is then not biblical it's wrong it's against you know god um or it's sinful right now the second type of frame they might move to is prognostic framing which is when they're going to say okay we agree one way is right one way is the wrong what are we going to do about it what's the prognosis how should we fix it so they would state here like this is what's acceptable and this is what's not acceptable, like in this second sign over here, right? A picture that says marriage, has a man and a woman in, a, you know, in their wedding um, outfits, and it clearly labels woman and man getting married. And then you have you know, an X'd out, um, an X over some text that says man and man, woman and woman. So it's clearly giving us the prognosis. This is the right kind of marriage. This is the wrong kind of marriage on the right. So they're claiming, you know, marriage can only be between a male and a female, or you know, some signs might propose that civil unions could be, you know, allowed but not marriage. And lastly, you know, motivational framing. So leading up to that Supreme Court case that decided gay marriage was legal on a federal level. There were a lot of different like statewide um, you know, legislation, pieces of legislation that started coming up across the country, you know, for or against gay marriage. Um, so a really big one was back in 2008 called Prop 8, Proposition 8 in California, which was to ban gay marriage across the state. And so as you can see down here, you know, they have these motivational frames, signs that are, you know, trying to motivate people on either side to vote for or against Proposition 8. 
you've got the woman in the red with a yes on eight, and there's a little picture of like a heterosexual nuclear family. Um, and then you have, you know, the guy holding a sign that says vote no on Prop 8. So they're, you know, motivating people to do something, to the call to action, right? This is what you're being encouraged to do, depending on which side of this movement you fall on. And, you know, you can see this in pretty much any social movement today, kind of these different types of framing. Um, now, sometimes uh, different social movements can come together within a frame alignment process. This is when different social movements kind of merge together, they merge their goals, and they might find some sort of common goal that they can fight for to maxi maximize their impact. So, you know, for instance, um, you know, the past few years, there's been an uptick in hate crimes against Asian Americans, um, Asian Pacific Islanders, against uh, Hispanic Americans, against Jewish Americans, and against African Americans. And usually all these groups, they kind of have their own movements, you know, pushing for, um, you know, legislation that benefits their specific, you know, ethnic or racial identity. But, you know, more recently, uh, a lot of leaders within these movements have been coming together in order to, um, you know, organize their groups um, to fight against hate crimes more generally. Because all of these different groups and movements have been facing very similar kind of uptick in hate crimes. So they can kind of find a common cause, even though they're all different and have other different goals that they want to achieve, they can find a common cause together within, you know, fighting hate crimes in our country. Um, so that's kind of a frame alignment process. You know, what's one thing we all have in common? Let's get together, let's fight for it. You know, we'll have more people um, maybe we'll have a greater chance of success. Now, there's kind of four aspects to this frame alignment process. You got the bridging um, aspect, which connects uninvolved individuals and unorganized or ineffective groups with social movements that, though they're not necessarily connected, they share a similar interest or goal. For instance, you know, back in the early 20th century, there was the women's movement, um, which was fighting for suffrage, right? That was kind of their main goal, getting the right to vote. But there was also the temperance movement going on, which was also primarily led by women, but was fighting for prohibition, you know, getting rid of alcohol in the country. Um, but, and so they had different goals, these two types of movements, but they often came together and helped each other out because they saw, you know, there were some similarities, some common goals they could come together and fight for. Second, amplification. Um, this is when organizations seek to expand their core ideas to gain a wider, more universal appeal. So expanding those ideas to get a little bit more broader can mobilize more people. So for instance, the Me Too movement, right, represents many different um, you know, women and their experiences, <clears throat> um, poor women, rich women, right, across the spectrum, big cities, rural, um, across the country, across the world. You know, people can all kind of um, you know, identify themselves with, you know, this hashtag Me Too. Number three, the extension phase, when social movements agree to mutually promote each other, even when social movements' goals don't necessarily relate to each other's immediate goals. This can happen when organizations are sympathetic to each other's causes, but not directly aligned. So throughout the 60s, you know, and a little bit earlier too, you know, women's rights movement and civil rights movements, they're 
goals weren't necessarily, you know, immediately aligned with each other. However, you know, they both kind of saw a similar, a similarity in their struggle, right, or their oppression. Um, and so they often worked to support each other, despite, you know, the other differences they had. In transformation framing, um, frame alignment is, occurs when a social movement achieves its goals and has to revise its purpose to stay relevant, right? So when the women's suffrage movement gained the right to vote when the 19th Amendment was passed, like we talked about in Chapter 12, you know, the women's movement kind of had to transform. Um, and by the 60s, you know, we had second wave feminism where the women's movement kind of reignited had reformed itself, reorganized with new goals, like joining the workforce or equal pay or getting women into education or elected offices. And this brings us to our third theoretical perspective on social movements. We're going to look at new social movement theory. And this comes to us from kind of a conflict theory perspective. And they argue, this is kind of more modern um, perspective on movements. So maybe applies to movements like since really starting in like the 60s and 70s, but um, especially in you know, the 21st century. And a lot of these social movements aren't necessarily primarily targeting like economic or political concerns, but instead focus on like the culture at large and the other issues of identity and you know, stigmatization. So new social movement theory kind of takes us this assumption that civil society has become the target of social movements. So rather than, you know, primarily just going through the institutions of government and trying to get your change made by passing bills and laws and all of that, um, you know, instead you try and get the word out to the people. And, you know, use this people power to make change, change hearts and minds <clears throat> rather than changing the state or the economy. So these social movements often revolve around a politics of identity, you know, a focus on accepting stigmatized identities like ethnic, ecological, indigenous, LGBTQ, women, um, and the organization of these movements. What really makes them stand out is that they're very democratic and non-hierarchical. They usually don't really have a big paid staff of professionals. They may not even have, you know, an organized workplace um, or infrastructure. Um, their decision making is very, you know, democratic. They try and get consensus if they are going to move forward with any kind of, you know, protest or um, or action. And related to that, they employ newer forms of engagement like direct action, which really, you know, direct action really kind of got, um, you know, um, famous uh, during, you know, the 1960s civil rights movement, 1950s, 60s, um, and 70s, you know, nonviolent protests, direct action, kind of putting yourself in like the line of fire, putting your body physically like at risk to make the point that you want to make. Um, you know, like these protesters up here in the picture, you know, they're all chained together. That's a direct action protest. And some examples over the next slide of, you know, some more, some examples of these types of movements. Um, there's some videos on Blackboard, which we'll get more into a lot of these if you're interested. Uh, but back in 2011, you know, we had Occupy Wall Street, uh, this big movement, really started in New York, but spread across the country in a lot of big cities. Um, 
but this was following up on you know like the 2008 recession and then there were the bailouts of the banks and all that um, but a lot of you know everyday people lost their houses you know went bankrupt um, and they weren't bailed out and so there was this really this strong sense of like resentment in the country um, which brought to bear the Occupy Wall Street movement and brought a lot of people out in public spaces and parks around, you know, um, other kind of public or arenas or areas. Uh, and people kind of just went out into the streets together to protest. Um, and there was a really famous slogan during the time, you know, like, we are the 99%, you know, and they felt kind of that the 99% of our society wasn't really being helped or represented. Then Black Lives Matter, there's a lot of direct action that goes on um, and is certainly you know, evident of like these new social movements. Um, this guy right here in the picture, his name was Jonathan Butler, and he went to um, Missoula and he or he was the Black Lives Matter kind of organizer at the university. And there were a lot of kind of, a lot of hate crimes going on on that university campus that weren't really being addressed at the time. And <clears throat> Mr. Butler, you know, got pretty, you know, ticked off that things weren't happening um, to address a lot of the um, racist actions that were happening on campus. So. He organized a hunger strike, um, and eventually that hunger strike led to the president of the university resigning from his position. But again, you know, direct action. He put his body kind of on the line through a hunger strike to make something happen. Um, these are the Kai activists. <laughs> um, they are well known for their environmental protests. So. Um, this specific picture is showing, you know, back in 2015, there was a Shell oil rig that was heading out into the Arctic to drill oil, um, you know, deep in the sea, and they wanted to protest this, so they got out on their kayaks together, you know, and tried to, like, blockade the, the rig from moving to where it needed to go to, um, which certainly, you know, they're certainly putting their bodies at risk there. Um, trying to block a gigantic oil um, rig from moving. Then in 2016, throughout the next few years, um, there were many protests um, in Native American um, reservations up in uh, North and South Dakota against the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, which was a pipeline which was uh, meant to come down from Canada through the U.S. But the issue was that the pipeline was uh, constructed to kind of go through Native American land and also put um, a lot of the rivers that they depend on and water sources at risk because um, oil spills can always happen. Uh, so there were a lot of protests um, you know, against this as well, going through indigenous lands, um, possibly putting at risk, you know, those water sources. Um, and as you can see, a lot of, you know, kind of uh, pushback from, from law enforcement on those protests as well. Black Lives Matter protests more broadly, um, you know, also signify a lot of this direct action, getting out into the street, um, you know, to, to kind of protest the culture, right, that um, seems to be pervasive. All right, so those are our three types of, or our three, you know, theoretical um, perspectives on social movements why they happen, what makes them successful. For resource mobilization theory, what makes a movement successful is primarily time and money. Um, for 
you know, framing analysis, what makes a movement successful is having the better frame, right, the better slogan that makes more people get emotional um, and motivated to you know, take action. And for a new social movement theory, the best protests, the most successful protests are going to be the ones that inspire people to get out into the street to take direct action, to, you know, um, recognize the power of people when they just come together and demand change. So now we'll turn to some issues with modern organizing. Um, so there's some concerns when it comes to organizing social movements today. Uh, number one would be you know, the installation of protest zones or free speech zones, um, which uh, really kind of gained a lot of traction in the early 2000s when there were a lot of protests against uh, the Iraq and Afghanistan war. And during the George W. Bush administration, a lot of practices went into effect that put a lot of limitations on public protests in the U.S. Sometimes if you wanted to have a protest, it would be like, you know, the government would set up like a fenced in area and say, okay, you know, you can go inside this fence and make your protest. Or you'd have things like this picture here that say like free speech zone. Um, it says like this area has been set aside for um, nonprofit groups to exercise their constitutional First Amendment free speech rights. The city of Black Rock um, does not encourage or discourage these activities and does not endorse um, or support in any way this particular uh, or protected right of expression, etc., etc. So, you know, again, kind of very set out area where this is where you can exercise your First Amendment right. Um, which I'm not sure if that's in the Constitution anywhere. So we have kind of like limitations to our First Amendment. Um, you also have the problem of you know, what's sometimes called the normalization of marches or the problem of the day after um, and issues with like sad participation um, so, for instance, as you all get older, you might notice that you know, every time there's a big election year, all of a sudden all these movements pop up um, about the year before the election and things get really, you know, uh, you know very passionate on many sides. Um, people are you know, motivated to get out and protest and do this and that. Um, but the problem is, you know, sometimes those movements don't, beyond election day, they kind of fade away. Um, the organizations, you know, lose traction or lose passion. Um, a lot of people will join in on marches or protests during an election year, but that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, they're truly committed to making a change or devote, really devoting themselves long term to a social cause. Some other issues when it comes to like social media um, and internet, you know, you never really know who is behind the other side of the computer, right? Who is, you know, working to make these frames? Who is trying to motivate people to get out into the street? And you know, our reliance on the internet when it comes to social movements is really ripe for manipulation. So for instance, you know, going back to um, around 2008, there was like this ups, upswing of like um, kind of revolutionary movements that seemed to be happening across uh, the Middle East. It was referred to as the Arab Spring at the time. But it came out a few years later that um, actually, you know, organizations within the U.S. government, along with MTV and Facebook and Google, were actually helping to organize a lot of these protests that were presented in the media as grassroots. <clears throat> um, 
which isn't to say, you know, that those were bad movements or they shouldn't have happened, but, um, you know, just kind of the, the manipulation of communication, uh, the way that these protests were presented to the world at the time, whereas like these spontaneous grassroots up, uprisings, um, when it was in fact kind of revealed a little bit later on that um, there were a lot of there's a lot of influence from the U.S. government um, and other U.S. organizations helping to promote these, you know, grassroots protests. Uh, there's another, I think this video is on Blackboard's um, still, but it also came out um, back in 2009 to 2012. There was a Cuban version of Twitter called Zoom Zuneo that got really popular in Cuba. You know, Cuba is a communist government still, and they have a lot of censorship, so they're not allowed to have Twitter. Um, and so they had Zoom Zuneo uh, instead. But also came out a little bit later um, that, in fact, the U.S. government and the U.S. AID um, had, in fact, created Zoom Zuneo and promoted it um, kind of covertly within Cuba in order to stir unrest within the country. Which again, going back to that, you know, again, right? I mean, Cuban communism in Cuba is certainly, uh, it's been a long, a long time, you know, out there and things certainly are not perfect. Um, and, you know, perhaps a great number of people in Cuba would love to have a democratic government um, or capitalism, right? <clears throat> However, you know, my main point in, in bringing up both of these things is not necessarily, you know, that, oh, we shouldn't have done that or, you know, um, how dare we as the U.S., but to just point out that if we can do these things to other countries, can manipulate other countries' movements um, or communication, well, that can always be turned around on us as well, right? So to always kind of keep in mind, like, who is, who's really behind kind of the things that we are reading on the internet, right? Especially when they're motivating us to take certain actions. All right, and now we'll turn to social change. So social change goes a little bit broader than just social movements. It refers to any change in society. It might be created through a social movement, but it might also be created through things like environmental shifts or population change or institutional revolutions or technological innovations. So anytime the status quo changes, whether it's intentional or random, human caused or natural can lead to social change. So environmental shifts, and we'll probably be seeing many of these in the decades to come. You know, effects of deforestation, depletion of soil, <clears throat> making, you know, crop yields um, weaker and weaker, overfishing of the oceans, unsustainable exploitation of natural resources, climate change, all of these things are going to have, you know, excuse me, ripple effects that are going to change the way that societies have to function in the future. Institutional revolutions. Of course, we started this class out talking about the importance of the industrial revolution, the fact that sociology exists is because the as a kind of reaction to the industrial revolution and what was happening and to try and explain like what was happening to society in the midst of it so you know during that time you know self-sufficiency um, extended families people living in more rural areas agrarian areas kind of became obsolete and we were replaced with you know, living in big, dirty, polluted cities, living close to factories, going to work um, and getting paid a wage, living with our nuclear family. Um, and, you know, all these kind of, you know, technological revolutions 
and that continue to happen in our society are going to continue to change you know, our economy, our political order, our social order, the ways that we learn, the way we think, communicate, shop, work, the way we live. Um, so, of course, all these kind of technological changes, these institutional revolutions have a big effect on you know, the way that our societies function as well. Population change, you know, global population growth. People are living closer together. They're living in cities more and more every year. They're living close to water at high risk of natural disasters. And as we talked about in chapter 13, um, you know, the global population is getting older, not just in the US, but everywhere. You know, labor shortages might occur as people retire. Um, Retirements will lead to loss of tax revenue. It's going to be a lot of pressure on pension, retirement, entitlement plans. It's going to be more need for elder health care um, and assisted living and increased demand for housing in warm climates. And this is going to happen globally. Technological innovation. You know, technology is the driving force of globalization. You know, think of all the different technological changes just over the past you know 200 300 years that have completely revolutionized the way that we experience life um you know from moving from horsepower and wind power to steam and rail power to the invention of the airplane refrigeration the digital age internet cell phones you know technological progress has a huge influence on how we function and how we relate to one another. Um, there's advances in communication, transportation, which brought more people together, shortened the span which is required for commerce to take place, for ideas to be transferred. Um, there's been huge advances in medical technology that are allowing us to live longer, to have children when we couldn't otherwise advances in agricultural technology, which may make, you know, global food production, you know, exponentially, um, you know, more re reliable. Maybe we can eradicate world hunger. Um, you know, we have genetically modified food organ um, organisms now and patented food products. And maybe with this last slide here, um, just to always keep in mind, especially when we talk about all the great things that technology brings us, um, and especially when we talk about things like Twitter and the fact that we can communicate with each other um, so effectively and quickly, it's important to keep in mind that not everyone around the world, even still today, um, has access to the internet. And so, we have this last term here for you, the digital divide. And this refers to the gap between those nations and the people that have access to a computer and the internet and those that don't. You know, WWW stands for World Wide Web. However, even still today, you know, the web is not really worldwide. There's a lot of people who are being kind of left out of this you know, digital universe. And some other things, of course, that will, I'm sure, become even more relevant in the years to come um, when it comes to you know, our reliance on the internet and technology, uh, especially for organizing society, you know, are things like security risks, privacy concerns, Know, this intense vulnerability that's created by our dependence on, you know, the internet or our computers or our phones for everything. Um, so those are, you know, just some of the cons that also, you know, come along with all of the pros of technological progress. And how can I, you know, talk about social change without, let's end on, you know, COVID-19. Um, obviously brought dramatic changes to our society, 
um, to our politics, to our economy, to our education system. It, you know, there were ripple effects throughout almost all of our social institutions caused by this you know, virus. And it also showed us just how interconnected our world is and our social norms. But all sorts of things changed, you know, from the most mundane to the very profound. You know, we had social distancing, social isolation. We were not able to interact with other people as we may have liked to. Um, you know, you couldn't sneeze in public, couldn't hug other people or our family members. Many people missed out on funerals. Many people missed out on births. Um, you know, even handshakes, uh, you know, the way that we worked changed profoundly. The ways that y'all went to school changed profoundly. Um, graduations, you know, weddings were postponed or went virtual or they were canceled. You know, classes went online. That changed a lot of things for teachers and for students. You know, many people lost their source of income, had a really hard time paying the bills, making ends meet. Grandparents weren't able to see their grandkids. You know, I'm sure each of your lives were profoundly affected in a number of different ways. Um, so for the Unit 4 discussion, one of the options is to write about, you know, how COVID-19 changed your own you know, life or your own perspective. So um, I always like to read those because everyone, you know, kind of experienced COVID-19 a little bit differently. Um, so, of course, you know, COVID changed things. Um, and, you know, hopefully it seems like we're coming out of, out of it, right? But who knows? Um, there will always be a new variant that changes all of that and we go back into lockdown. Um, hopefully not, but it is a possibility since it's happened before. So that brings us to the end of Chapter 21, Social Movements and Social Change. And it also brings us to the end of this class. Um, so I hope you all have enjoyed this little intro to sociology class. Hope you've taken at least one thing away from this class that'll stick with you um, in the years to come. Maybe you'll keep thinking about um, in future decades, something in your future career might you know, happen and you think, oh, I remember that thing we talked about in that lecture once. Um, and I really enjoyed this semester with y'all. Um, so we're really coming up to the end now. Just pay attention to your announcements on Blackboard and the emails I send out. Um, we're getting up toward, you know, the final exam um, and the last couple of written assignments here. All right. Well, I hope you all have a wonderful day or evening or whatever time of day it is that you're listening to this. And um, please reach out to me if you have any questions um, or concerns as we are wrapping up the semester. All right. Thank you. Bye.